Our first stop is Jackson Hall, where we stay in the beautiful Amangani Hotel, and we can see the beautiful Teton Mountains right from our balcony. At about 7,000 feet, the alpine air is crisp and clear. You feel you could see forever. No time to spare, so we grab a hire car and head off into the Tetons National Park. The scenery is breathtaking. With no foothills, the snow-capped mountains rise straight from the valley floor. On this quiet stream we saw a marmot. He ignored us and carried on doing what marmots do. The whole area is a haven for wildlife. The next two clips were copied from the local visitors centre. Back in the wild, we saw this moose knee-deep in a pond chomping away at his favourite willow leaves. We never saw moose on the road, but the pronghorned sheep can cross unexpectedly. Feeling brave, we took the aerial tramway that whisked us up to over 10,000 feet. Having climbed to the very peak, we considered the quicker way down. But decided as we were in no hurry, the tramway would be quick enough. We take one last look at the Grand Teton Mountains as we head north up towards Yellowstone Park. This bridge is the Southern Access Road, popular with Harley Davidsons, caravans and motorhomes but they had to ban the fishermen. It just became too popular. This bison seems to be in charge of crowd control. Or he could be just waiting for the bus. This elk is a handsome creature with his velvet covered antlers. An itch can sometimes be difficult to reach. The brown dot in the distance is a grizzly bear. But on the other hand, perhaps he's as near as I want him to be. The sheer scale of these mountains, waterfalls and valleys is impossible to describe.
I spent some time watching this hole in the tree before I was rewarded with this. Even slowed down is pretty quick. Now these guys are travelling at a somewhat more leisurely pace. Quite close to the road we saw this young black bear. He didn't seem to mind us watching him, he just carried on about his business. Moving right along, we come to the Mammoth Hot Spring Terraces, where mineral rich springs leave multicoloured deposits on the hillside. This area reeks of caustic and is completely devoid of wildlife, apart from one stupid bison who seems to be enjoying the peace and quiet, and a lone elk just talking to himself. Next stop is Old Faithful, the famous geyser that regularly shoots water about a hundred foot up in the air every two hours or so. I was reliably informed that the correct pronunciation is geyser. Apparently I'm an old geyser, this is a geyser. This spectacle is regularly watched by hundreds if not thousands of tourists who watch in almost total silence, which is quite something for a predominantly American audience. This violent eruption continues for six or seven minutes, but I will spare you the unedited version. Throughout the park you can find weird bubbling lakes and strange smelling chemicals leaching out of the earth. There is just so much water, lakes, rivers and waterfalls everywhere. These buffalo look so quiet and friendly, but I think they're best viewed from a safe distance. As we carry on we see more geysers, more water jets and even more bubbling pools. The 
This pair of crows seem to be having a Turkish bath next to a steam vent. It's now time to say goodbye to Yellowstone Park and head north through Wyoming up into Montana. It's very hot and dry with temperatures almost 100 degrees which has caused this forest fire. Up high on this pole you can see an osprey nest. And if you watch very carefully you can see a smaller bird that has the downstairs apartment. Next day we turn west and head into Idaho and join the Lewis and Clark Trail. The weather's not so good and neither is the road but the scenery more than makes up for it. We pass through sleepy villages and follow the Snake River with its many hydroelectric dams. Until it reaches the Columbia River which has even more hydroelectric dams. The distant view of Mount Hood confirms we're now in Oregon. We pass through Portland and arrive on the Pacific coast at Astoria, which sits at the mouth of the Columbia River. Apparently out there there is a dangerous sandbar, which is a graveyard for some 200 ships. This enormous bridge is nearly three miles long and takes traffic across to Washington State. We stayed at the old Cannery Pier Hotel which is right beneath the bridge. To go downtown you could ride in this lovely old Cadillac. This massive sea lion seems to have commandeered the jetty. Everything in Astoria moves at a sedate pace. In a somewhat faster mode, these sand dunes look like a lot of fun. Although they can be hazardous to shipping. We are now heading south down the Oregon coast and into the redwood forests. Here the trees just keep getting bigger and bigger. Some of them grow in excess of 300 feet tall. Back on the coast we find some sea lions relaxing. Sunbathing space seems to be at a premium. These fishermen cleaning their catch make a free meal for local wildlife.
Today is the 4th of July and we spent the evening joining the celebrations in the seaside town of Eureka. Back in the quiet of the forest, we see this fallen tree, which is 362 foot long. Apparently, when it fell, the crash was heard up to 10 miles away. No visit to the giant redwoods would be complete without a drive through tree. And needless to say, I had to try it too. We continue driving south through this tranquil redwood forest. We spend the night in a luxury lodge overlooking the ocean at a village called Elk. We end our American adventure overlooking Angel Island in San Francisco. We've had a wonderful trip exploring the sites of Northwest America. I will now recall some of the places we've been and sites we have seen. <laughs>